That's okay. Are you serious? You're serious? Oh, God. Okay. And I'm so feeling bad about this, but I am going to keep on pressing. And I hope you will hang with me. Um, whoop. Just make sure I am so sorry to say that I did not record that first part. Okay. So we have, we have quite a, a bit to get through on, on GI. Okay, so let's now talk about ulcerative colitis. So remember I said it's quite different than Crohn's disease. So um, in contrast to Crohn's, it is continuous and it starts, actually, let me, that's the third point. It's not transmural. It usually is pretty superficial. <coughs> so only rarely extends below the mucosal surface. Inflammation starts in the rectum and moves up. So a person with ulcerative colitis, for all, all people, they'll have at least the rectal involvement and then they might have some part of the colon and it's continuous. So um, your, your yeah. pan colitis is shown here where the entire colon and the rectum are inflamed. So um, you get this, as I said, it's a superficial impact. So you get um, engorgement, the, the mucosal ulceration, high um, amount of bleeding that happens. So it's very common to have bloody um, output, bloody diarrhea. And the colon being the primary site of absorption means you are decreased um, ability to absorb, reabsorb water and sodium. So you get watery diarrhea and it is often bloody. I've got a list uh, later that will reinforce that. So here, you've got a squeaky clean colon, <laughs> very healthy. Um, and this is just showing the cobblestone types of uh, appearance of the deeper um, ulcerations in the, in the sigmoid colon when you have Crohn's. And this is showing the, the more, um, you know, it's trying to show anyway, the more superficial types of, of ulceration and the bloody bleeding. Um, it tends to be much more, uh, like I said, superficial um, impact on the mucosal surface. And there's, there are videos. I used to have a video that was kind of a neat thing, but it has <coughs> not worked in recent years. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, so manifestations. Uh, sorry. Oop, what happened? I just de went right past the whole thing as I looked down. So common symptoms, abdominal pain, rectal inflammation and bleeding, watery, bloody diarrhea we talked about. Um, <coughs> ma the majority of patients will have mild uh, episodic disease. So it comes and goes two, three stools a day with some rectal bleeding. Much, much more rare is severe disease. When it is severe, it's severe, and it has some, some profound impact um, where you have up to 20 to 30 stools per day and, and profuse rectal bleeding. You get anemia, fever, weight loss, significant growth um, failure in kids that, that are um, dealing with this. And um, similar to Crohn's, you get extra intestinal manifestations. Right, so very similar in that way. Not so similar um, is colon cancer. Colon cancer risk significantly increases the longer a person has ulcerative colitis. In patients that have pan colitis and it's significant, severe disease, 10 years or longer, their risk for colon cancer goes up 10 to 20 times. And in those patients, particularly those with acute pan colitis, significant inflammation, long standing, surgical removal of the colon is often uh, the fix, okay? So we don't just take out a colon as soon as somebody has ulcerative colitis, right? We're trying to keep the, the quality of life as high as possible and all of the functions of the colon going as well as we can. But at some point when it's really severe disease, it fixes it to remove the colon, okay? And that's the good news about ulcerative colitis. Um, Nutritional concerns. There are a few that I want us to think about. Sorry, I've got to catch up in my notes over here. Where am I? So iron deficiency anemia, if you think about the, the act of bleeding, loss of blood through the stool, um, iron deficiency anemia, 
Inadequate intake, so again, just like with Crohn's, people will avoid food groups thinking that, that that's causing their symptoms, um, and it may be, right? So we have keep, um, food diaries are important. Weight loss, I mentioned. Folate, again, of, if they're avoiding fruits and vegetables or, and or if they're on sulfazalazine that decreases folate absorption. Loss of water and electrolytes, minerals, protein losses, exudative losses with the inflammatory process. Um, so that's not, oh, it's a software update, Katie. That's what it is. Pardon me for the noise. I don't know. I, I'm not going to do it right now. Um, and um, what else do I want to say about ulcerative colitis? I guess nutritional management. Very similar in terms of our energy and protein. We don't have a lot to go on that would differentiate or... Um, you know, mandate higher protein or higher energy needs necessarily. Um, what is unique to ulcerative colitis is a lot of work being done with fermentable um, fibers, short chain fatty acids having a very powerful impact, positive impact on the colonocytes. So I want you to know this, short chain fatty acids provide fuel to the colon. Those colonocytes will respond by that energy source. They tend to, it, um, the short chain fatty acids increase cellular proliferation in the colon, so it can help actually um, regenerate and, and uh, some healing, promote healing. Uh, microbial fermentation of fiber and, and fructooligosaccharides, those prebiotics, yield short chain fatty acids, so that's one major way that we, um, we get those to the colon. And short-chain fatty acids increase colonic blood flow. They stimulate pancreatic enzyme secretion, promote water and sodium reabsorption, and promote intestinal colonic. If you want, I've said intestinal there, meaning large intestinal. Write colonic out there just so that you're not confused. When we're talking about the ulcerative colitis, we really are talking about the colon. Colonic mucosal growth because it's such a powerful fuel source for the colonocyte. Okay. Um, other experimental uh, interventions that have been done, uh, large doses of fish oil have been shown to decrease corticosteroid requirements in some but not all studies. So it's not something that is strongly evidence-based. Um, you can find studies that show it has an impact and others that don't. So it's not typically standard recommendation. Um, if somebody wants to try it, they can try it, and it may be helpful to them, right? Um, but it's not something that we, we recommend um, with evidence, you know, strong evidence. This point, fat restriction and fat-soluble vitamin supplementation are not necessary. And in the interest, oh, it would be so great to just have a discussion right now about that. What I would like you to do in your notes is I want you to think about, explain why not. Okay, and that might be part of our homework for next time. I'll ask you to think about that. <coughs> um, what else? Our electrolytes may be supplemented as needed. Iron supplementation, if you've got iron deficiency anemia. And I've got a comparison here, Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. So this is just a, a way to sort of help you differentiate the two disease processes. And so the why not of the nutritional management is important. That's why the pathophysiology is so important. So I'm, I'm just going to say that. Just think about what's going on with ulcerative colitis and what's happening in Crohn's. Not all Crohn's, right, but a lot of them with the terminal ileitis. And that question I just asked you a moment ago, hopefully it will be obvious when you get home and, and um, engage if we don't do it today. Okay, any questions about ulcerative colitis? Okay, so let's talk about ostomies. So I just told you that a person who has their colon removed, who has ulcerative colitis, it, it, it uh, solves, it, it cures the disease. You may also see um, colon resection in a person with Crohn's, and that doesn't cure them, but anyway, regardless of why their colon is resected, or maybe they have colon cancer, right? There are lots of reasons why somebody's colon may be removed. So this is a little bit stepping away and broad, a, a more broad discussion about ostomies. Um, 
it, it is relevant for people with inflammatory bowel, but it's not only for people with inflammatory bowel disease, if you get that, okay? So ostomies may happen um, when your colon is re removed for whatever reason. Um, so the first one I wanna talk about is when you have a total colectomy and you're, you pull the end of the ileum out for fecal drainage, okay? That's, that's the colon and the rectum are removed. You've got the ileum still. The end of the ileum gets pulled through the, the surface of the skin. I'll show you a picture in a moment. When you've got that happening, when the total colon, I mean the entire colon gets removed, such as somebody who had pan colitis and from ulcerative colitis and we needed to remove that, it's very liquid drainage. If you think about it, the higher up in the GI tract that you are, so if you're dealing with the ileum, it's not, you know, it's not meant to reabsorb sodium and fluid. It can adapt to a certain amount. Um, you're going to have more liquid stool. So normal output for an ileostomy is about 500 ml per day of water. Okay, and you lose you know, some sodium and, and chloride. So remember that normal bowel water in a person without GI disease of any variety is 100 to 200 ml per day. So just to put that in perspective, normal ileostomy output is 500. Now there are a few options for drainage appliances. I have a video that I will you know, feel free to go look at and there's some other things um, out there, I mean on the website. Um, this is an example of a, uh, an external ileostomy bag, lays flat against the abdomen. Um, I think I have, I think there's some videos showing people dealing with various ostomy um, kinds of things. This is an internally, um, an internal reservoir, a continent ileostomy, and I've got um, something that I will just point out here. There's a one-way valve, right? And the stoma is at the skin level, and there's no bag attached, okay? And so some people can deal, can, can um, manage quite well with a continent ileostomy. It, um, at first, it requires frequent drainage um, where you basically evacuate, um, you insert a tube through the stoma and you evacuate into the bowl of the, the toilet. At first, it requires more, and as you adapt, the ileum is able to adapt to a certain amount um, in terms of being more able to absorb. Um, the capacity over time will increase quite a bit so that um, you know, they, they can go longer between evacuation. I guess that's all I wanna say about that. Um, and then this is another uh, more common, or getting more common, <coughs> ileal pouch anal anastomosis. And actually, I, I say that it's more common, but I know that there are also more um, complications that people tend to, um, can have with this. So basically, you are attaching the ileum to the anal sphincter so that you can have normal evacuation, although it's not normal, it's gonna be higher liquid, right? So it's gonna be more frequent. But what happens is you'll get pouchitis. So um, you can get bacteria <coughs> growing uh, in the pouch area and that can be that bacterial overgrowth kind of um, can problem. The ileum will, will adapt over time, but the best it tends to do is to be able to reabsorb maybe 300 to 600 ml per day. You know, I mean, it's, your, your output will be around that 300 to 600. So you don't get to 100 to 200, you don't get normal, but it's pretty, um, it, it can adapt pretty well. And that can avoid the need for an ileostomy, which is why it's a popular, or a, a, you know, it's a, it's a good option for, for some. Um, okay, what about um, post-op after having an ileostomy? We're gonna progress the diet to regular, ultimately. And um, really, we just, we, we tell people to chew their food well. Um, I've known people with ileostomies that have no trouble whatsoever with popcorn, but if you're, if you're you know, you. The way, I think it's the way we tend to eat popcorn and often, you know, you're, you're scarfing it in a, in a dark movie theater. Maybe you're not chewing it very well. You're not taking the time, right? Um, it can block a stoma. So if you look at ileostomy recommendations, we're gonna say avoid, you know, minimize um, foods that are potentially gonna block that stoma and they can block the stoma, popcorn, nuts, you know, I think if you're chewing your foods pretty well, you probably, you know, people get away with that. It's conservative to say. No, no popcorn nuts. Um, increasing fluid, salt, um, potassium. People should salt their food liberally if they've got an ileostomy. 
They may need additional zinc. Dehydration is common, so they need to uh, drink and salt their food. And often they, people can do pretty well um, with an ileostomy. Now, if there's any other part of the colon that's still there, um, we'll call it a colostomy, right? So part of the, whatever part gets removed, you'll have the end is, is coming, uh, is out um, as, as a colonoscopy. So right-sided colonoscopy um, is more liquid, like output from an ileostomy. Um, and that's over here, right side, ascending colon, or part of the transverse, any of this part. Um, that's going to be a more liquid output. Left-sided, that would be the descending colon. Stoma is in the descending, or it's in the sigmoid colon. The drainage is going to be more solid. And that just um, often, with that kind of uh, left-sided colostomy, you won't need a, a bag um, either, not necessarily. So you can do the evacuation method. What else? These are sort of um, not, a, not a ton of uh, evidence to say this. These are sort of things you might try. I would put that in the things you might try. If somebody has diarrhea, giving them um, not a brat diet, but giving them some sources of pectin, soluble fiber, and then slow things down a little bit. Um, yogurt, you know, kefir, things that may uh, <laughs> potentially, and it's so just things that people might try and find effective, okay? So it's not evidence-based, really. Um, in constipation, you know, it can happen as well, um, especially with those left-sided colostomies. So just like with any other group, you know, you can, uh, you know, increasing fiber, assuming they don't have strictures or any other things going on in terms of inflammatory bowel um, kind of symptoms. Fluid intake is always the most important thing for, for constipation management. People are tending to not drink enough fluid, increasing fruits and vegetables. So you can see where a combination of you know, Crohn's and, and or, or ulcerative colitis, um, you know, maybe you, you, you've got things you need to think about in terms of people avoiding whole food groups, et cetera. Um, other things about ostomies are uh, gas, former, <coughs> gas forming foods tend to be these types of foods. It doesn't mean necessarily that you tell people to avoid them. I mean, if they don't, a lot of people will adapt. I mean, if they're eating the diet before they get their ostomy and it's full of legumes, they're probably not going to have a trouble with this. So this is, again, rules of thumb, not really rules even, just things to, to think about. Um, these tend to be foods that are associated with significant odor. And when you've got a bag um, and, and an ostomy, people are self-conscious about that. This could be helpful. So finding the that they have foods that are, they're, they're getting a lot of odor. Um, okay, so I've put that, these are somewhat variable, not evidence-based, things that they might, you might just look for as you're doing a history with somebody. And here's what they may look like. So it tends to be kind of pink, it's just the intestinal tissue as it gets pulled out, and an ileostomy will be out, it'll stick out a little bit, and that's because the liquid drainage, we don't want it on the skin, right? It can cause skin breakdown. So the uh, ileostomy is going to be much more, you know, a, a, it will project a little bit from the skin, whereas colostomies tend to be flat on the um, skin surface. Wow, okay, we're at short bowel. Hmm, let's see. I'm going to give you a break, uh, not a break, um, a, a break in my voice, because I am lulling you to sleep. I am aware of that. Um, so let me just think about this for a second. Actually, I'm going to stop and we'll stop the recording. You guys stand up for a second and just stretch, OK? Um, I'll, I'll record it just in case. Hi, Amanda. Before I forget, is, next, is on Monday's class, is that in here or a different Yes. Topic? Thank you for, because I forgot to mention that to you. Well, I mean, you guys know. It's on the syllabus, right? Um, class next week is Monday. So we have this truncated time frame. I will post tonight about class. Um, I'm going to have you do a parenteral calculation as part of the pre-work pre for Monday. But um, yeah, class is here, right? It's here, isn't it? Yes, I totally booked this room. I'm nearly a... No, oh, you think it's a... <laughs> I'm like, I'm 99.9% .9 sure. Are you serious? Really? Oh. Oh. 
I do. I do have a memory, maybe, of, of booking a different. Well, because I couldn't get this room. Maybe. Okay, Katie is going to look that up while we move on. We're going to do a calculation. Thank you for bringing it up, Amanda, because I will. We we need to. Um, this isn't so good, is it? We've got too, too much stuff. How in the world? Okay, we're in Burbank, so it's room 330, and ah. it's on the syllabus. On yeah. it's on the syllabus. Yay! Okay. So it's the same time, but it's Monday, and it's room 330. Thank you very much. Everybody, hear that? Room 330. <coughs> you guys will be up in 330. I'll be here wondering where is everyone, right? <laughs> no, I'm not that bad. Plus, I, Katie is going to be. <laughs> Uh, it's terrible, isn't it? Really... Okay, now, this is where I stopped, and I don't know, I guess because I put you guys on to C, and I'm looking, what was C? 4C was check. Does this exceed the maximum glucose infusion rate? First of all, is everybody with me? You've got the sample two-in-one calculation that's at the back of the parenteral nutrition support notes. It's a sa sample calculation for PN, because so I want you to have this up so you can... And this is what you need to get you through the, P the, the uh, sample PNS calculation two <coughs> assignment that I'm going to have you do, um, most likely at home. I know I'm lost. Where was I? 4C. So I think, oh, I can't remember what I had you do. And I, I said groups one through five, I said do it the first way, where you figure out what the maximum is. The max is five milligrams per kilogram per minute. So you follow that calculation, groups one through five. Did you guys actually, did you guys do it? Yeah. Or did we get, um, did all the groups one through, where are you all? <laughs> are you all one through five that, at the top of the classroom here? Did you manage to get that done before we left class? Can I see some, I'm seeing some nods. Um, okay, if you didn't, um, you're gonna have to do it for homework, but it's right there, it tells you how to do it. Can, can I have, um, I'm just, are you group two? I'm, I'm making eye contact over here, so you, know, that's my, if you don't mind. Would one of you all say what you guys got? Um, and I'm gonna actually, if you don't mind, I'm gonna write it out. So I'm following along with part C, and so I don't know who's speaking at your table over there. Um, I'm gonna start by writing out the five megs per kilogram per minute, because that's the first thing you probably did if you were following the directions. Okay. Yeah. End of the parental nutrition support notes. It's basically, I add them in at the end of the three or two per page notes. Is, I think is where it is, where we have the sample calculation for PN two and one. And it should be, hopefully it's the first, first one. Okay, group two, do you have a speaker? And, and say your name for everybody. Stacy, and for 4C we got 3.5 megs per kilogram per minute. All right, can you walk me through it though? <laughs> or can I? Yeah, just help me out with, I'm, can you see what I'm doing up here? So I'm going to say five, and then you did times, what did you use for the weight? We used 77 kilograms. Thanks. I'm just going to label the units, everybody. And then you did times 1440 minutes in a day, right? You divided that by 1,000, and I'm not going to, well, did you do it? Did you do it methodically? Did you write it out? Because I don't have my math here. At the, I mean, we got the end point. Can you, can some, so let's all do it together. Um, five times 77 times 1440 divided by 1,000 is what? And actually, was that what you, what did you come up with, Stacey? What was the, the that's the answer, <laughs> right? Um, I'm sure I have a lot of numbers here. I'm sorry, can some, help them out. I mean, this, lots of you guys did it, right? How about you all, did you do it? Five. Five, five times 77 times 1440, where did you? 554. 500 and what? 54. 50, sorry, I'm like, what? 554 grams per day. 
So that would be the max number. So does that, does our value exceed that? Is the answer, is the question we're asking, right? I mean, that's, no, right, why? What was our, what was our max, what were we giving in terms of dextrose? 347. Three, um, that, wait, is that grams of dextrose? Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> I had I had an error over on the other side. Um, yeah, don't look over here for some reason. I can't remember why I have that. Um, okay, so that's that's one way. That is the one way to do it, right? We we say what is our max, and have we exceeded it? No, great, we're good to go. Now, group six through ten, you guys actually figured out what is the GIR. Can I get um, group eight? I don't know. I don't know where eight. Eight, where are you? Did you all do it? Did you get a chance to do it before class ended? To figure out what the actual GIR is? So what we figured out right now is what, what it would be, what is five milligrams? What would that be, total grams of dextrose? So we know we're not exceeding it. So we've answered the question, but now I'm curious, what is the actual GIR that we're giving with 347 grams of dextrose a day. Did you guys do it? And if not, I'll put, I'll, I'll, so did group nine or seven? No? Seven? Six? Are the answers on this wrong? I'm looking at the sheet and everything's already filled out for us, but B has four. What sheet are, is already filled out for you? <laughs> in our notes? Yeah, in our notes. No, no, no. Okay. The sample calculation is a sample, right? That is filled out because it's a sample for you guys to follow when I'm not around teacher telling you, right? We're doing a different example with different numbers. <coughs> That's a really, did everyone else get that? <laughs> or we all kind of like, I, you were all like, what in the hell are you doing? Oh, excuse me. Um, are you with me? Were you all really all, uh, all thinking that? that? Like, what am I doing? Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, not to say, but it's a natural, you know, yeah. problem. What the heck, Kara, what do you want to say? Oh, I just did a quick one. I came up with 3.1. Okay, wait, don't give me a number. Oh, sorry. I mean, I love that you have the answer, but can you walk us through it? Okay, so I'm going to actually, so now, what do we want to, so, so Jenna, are you, you following now, right? You've got the, we've got these numbers that came from case one, really. We chose case one. We had 77 kilo body weight. We had 116 yeah, grams of protein and 2,000 calorie per day that we were aiming for. Okay, and if, if yeah, if you if you you might have missed. So if you were not here, whatever, get the notes from the previous parts because I I had an error in that first one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think people up. needed those original numbers again, like what we were aiming for, what you just showed. Um, let me write it up here. Yeah. So it's this was delivery. this was case one, you know, we used his numbers. So everybody, just so you can see, the guy was 77 kilo body weight. Thank you, Katie, sometimes, and Jenna, I forgot, you know, what details are important. We said 116 grams of protein was our target and 2,000 calories total, right? And we, wor we worked through all of the steps of that sample two and one up until the point of getting out, figuring out the GIR. Okay, so now back to Kara. Okay. So, wait, and I've lost my, let me just make sure I'm following. So you had. So I went off of 347 grams dextrose. Okay. Times 1,000 milligrams per gram. Equals 347,000 milligrams. Yep. Divided by 77 kilograms. Can you all follow that? I can barely see it there. Sorry. Divided by 77. Comes up to 4,506 milligrams per kilogram. All right. And then divided that by 1,440 minutes. Per day equals? 3.1. Awesome. Thank you so much. 3.1 milligrams per kilogram per minute. So that is the actual GIR <coughs> that we're infusing at, and it's well below five, so we know we're in good shape. And you're right, that is complicated. I'm not going to put that on an exam. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just too, I mean, think of the units. I mean, it's just, it's, you could do it. You're smart enough that you've done harder stuff in chemistry exams, right? I mean, I know you have. You have survived chemistry. Barely. Okay, well, maybe. Okay. And I may regret that, but anyway, I don't think, I don't think that's, it's not unreasonable. All right. Thank you all. Now, we're on part D. We're on page two of the, well, whatever, actually, I don't know if I've, it's numbered page. Do you have a number on your page? Sample two and one. We're at step D, where it says, determine how many ml of your 70% dextrose solution, the stock solution, do you need to get that 347 <coughs> grams of dextrose? Everybody with me? That's our next step. We have to figure out how many mls of that 70% uh, stock solution. So if it's a 70% dextrose stock solution, what am I going to do? And if you have paper, I highly recommend that you write along with me, just so you're, you know, keeping notes. So what am I going to do? It's a 70% solution, right? So somebody shout out, tell me. Kristen? It's 70 grams per 100 ml. All right, thank you. 70 grams of dextrose per 100 ml solution. And we're going to put it, set it up in, as an equal, 347 over x ml. Somebody solve, a, solve that for the x ml for me. I literally have not done this, so I am relying on your calculating, calculating skills here. Somebody grab a mic and say it. I want all of you calculating this, please. You've got phones. I know you have phones. Somebody shout it out, please. 496. Thank you. I heard of. Do we have a consensus? Just rounding. I did round. Okay. 490. We'll say we'll round it up. So we need 496 ml of a D70 solution, right? Okay. That's great. Thank you. Now we've got protein to work out. So this is step five. I'm not really in order anywhere, and I'm circling everything, so it's a little bit hard to follow. How many, um, so now we want to find out how many ml of a 20% amino acid solution. That's the stock solution. We're always going to use 20% amino acid for our class anyway, and it's common, 70% dextrose. You all at your tables, and the first group that gets it gets a gold star. I don't know. We don't have any stars, <coughs> but, you know, calculate how many ml of amino acid solution right now please. And if you do, take, take a moment, each of you do it at your place and then come, come to consensus. We're going to take a minute to do this. And I'll remind you, we need 116 grams of protein, right? Is that? Yeah, 116 grams of protein is our <coughs> amount of protein we need to get. <laughs> so let's see, a call them. Group two. You ready? Awesome. <coughs> Yay. Okay, can you walk me through that? I'd love it. That's what I want. I want that kind of, you know, just grab the mic and say it right out loud. Okay. Can you tell me how you did that? And I said it's 20 grams to 100 milliliters. Yep. Um, and then 116 grams over X, and then cross multiplied and divided and got 580 milliliters. So I multiplied 116 grams by 100 and divided by 20 grams. Beautiful. So you got 580 is, it, is what you said? Did everybody else get that? Any arguments? Okay, beautiful. Thank you so much. And we're going to write that as AA20. All right, now where are we? Let's flip it over. So we're at, ooh, we're at the determining the final volume. Oh, man. And this is where I'm going to get in trouble because, um, well, no, we're not, I'm not going to get in trouble. Am I going to get in trouble? Um, no, I'm not, because we're not doing it. Yep, yeah, never mind. Okay, so now what do we need to do? We have 496 and 580. Guess what? We add those. Can somebody do that? And, I don't know, a different group. How about group 5, wherever you are? 1076. Thank you very much. 
So 1076 ml. Now I did not show you what I just did, so let me do this more proper, proper, more properly. Boy, that's good grammar. 496 ml D70 plus 580 ml AA20 is. I'm sorry. Would you say that again? Short-term memory. 11. What? 1076. 1076. 1076 ml, um, and that's a two-in-one solution. Okay, but that's not the only thing we're doing, right? Um, now, what I say is when you're, I'm going to flip, I'm going to, well, let's see, I'll do it like this. Can you all see that? Okay. Um, so what I say below that is that you're going to have at least 100 ml of, of additional stuff that's going in there. I mean, for lack of, it's standard electrolytes, okay? So we're going to add 100 ml at least to that volume to accommodate electrolytes. Um, so that brings us to, so we'll, you know, we've got 1076. We'll add 100 for um, electrolytes. Sometimes it, it'll take a little more than that. Um, and what else do I say there? I'm looking at what I say. If that, the 1176 total volume is the minimum, absolute minimum, that you can accommodate the protein needs and the um, energy needs. Now, I haven't finished um, writing this. If I were going to be, I'm not, and I'm not done yet, right? We know we also have lipids that we're adding, okay? So I haven't forgotten about lipids. So we know that this volume is the <coughs> maximal concentration of dextrose and, and amino acids we can do. And the reason I teach you to you this way is because sometimes you've got somebody who has an extreme need for a fluid restriction. And if you can calculate a PN this way, you're in the best shape you can possibly be because you can't do any, any more than, you can't concentrate it any more than this using those stock solutions, okay? Now, the other thing that we consider is we divide it by 24 to figure out what kind of rate we're looking at. So can somebody, can group seven, can you divide that by 24 hours so we can figure out what a final volume might be? Group seven, where are you? If you don't mind. 1176 divided by 24, what do you get? <coughs> so V, 49. 49, all right. Um, so um, because well, let's just leave it at that. We'll just say 49. So when you do 49 times 24, when you go back to that, because there might have been a rounding, what is the exact volume? Is it a clean? Is it totally clean? So 1176 is 49 ml per hour? Yeah. All right, let's go with it then. Now, sometimes we might up the volume a little. We might say, well, we need a little more other things. We're going to just go to the, the closest you know, we might say 1.5 because we want to give other fluid, right? We want to make sure we're giving adequate fluid. There are lots of reasons why the volume might be different. So I, but for our purposes, we're going to say 1176. That is ultimately, um, we'll run that at 49 ml per hour. I'll just make a, a note of that, okay? Now we're at step seven now, right? So step seven is we got to calculate the final concentration of dextrose and amino acids in that that bag, the bag that has the dextrose and amino acids in it. Group one through five, will you please do part A where you figure out the percent dextrose, remembering that the, we've got 347 grams of dextrose in that 1176 volume. Group uh, six through 10, will you please do the percent amino acids where you've got 116 <coughs> grams of amino acids in 1176 final volume. Are we there? Group four, can you please tell us what your answer is for and how you did it? Well, I, I can imagine, but you can walk me through it if you don't mind. Um, okay, so you would do the 347 grams of dextrose divided by 1176 milliliters, which is the total mm -hmm. volume of the solution. 
and that gives you 29.5%. All right, awesome. If you multiply it by 100, sorry. Yep, times 100, okay. sorry. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, so that was group four. How about, I like nine, can we say? Am I, am I leaning too hard on the same group? Forgive me if I am, because I, I tend to get stuck on numbers. Group nine, where are you? Are you in the corner? Are you nine? Yeah. Group nine, would you, would you be able to tell us the answer for the percent amino acid and how you did it, please? And um, it, please, let's do this, if you don't mind, because I've also got my back to you, but can we go back to the habit of saying your name, use the mic, <laughs> just for everybody, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, Carrie. I'm still working on six. Like you're moving a little too fast I'm for me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's okay. okay. All right. Um, do you ha shall we work this together or take another thirty? I mean, are you close to doing it? Or I'm, yeah, I'm getting there. Just no, go for it. Is anyone else at your table? Is it your friend? Okay. All right. If we have, I don't mean to go too fast. Are there questions, while you guys are working on that, are there questions about this conceptually for the dextrose? Did, ever, did the groups, when you did the dextrose, were there questions about how to do that? Okay. Yeah, I don't mean to go too fast. I know this is new stuff. No, I'm, I'm gonna let this, I mean, I, I don't. I want to be fair, and I don't mean to put over pressure on you either. <laughs> when you're ready, or if you have questions, we can move to a different group. I'm, I'll give either of those choices. Okay. I totally get that. Yeah. And others at your table are in a similar boat. There. Okay. Can I can I um, get a, a different group? Six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. Ten. I haven't asked for ten. You guys want to do something? Did you do it? Can you can you walk us through how to do it? And then um, I'm ready when you are. Can I verify that the answer is right before I? No, it doesn't matter. You know what? It's there's no. Okay. Yeah, this is all learning, and and I really don't mean to make anyone feel. Okay. Stress. This is not my job, my role. I mean, my goal. So, so similarly yeah. to the dextrose, I just took the 116 grams of amino acid over the final volume. Yep, that is spot on. Which was 9.86. All right. Multiply it by uh, would it, well, I'm sorry, what'd you say? 9.86. All right, so we're going to round up to single digits. Okay, so we'll just, we'll just say 9.9% .9 amino acid. Now, does that make sense to everybody? I mean, and we can, we can practice this a little more. Um, that was part seven, right? We have part eight, I think, is the last step that I want you to, that helps us kind of walk through. No, we're not quite done. We're almost done. So step, I'm going to put this up here for the moment. So what is step eight? Step eight is calculating the osmolarity. All right, so we now have end percent for dextrose and amino acids. So shall we just do this and please some, walk with me to do this so that you can calculate it. So if you say the final concentration times 50, if we're going to do the osmolarity, of this solution for the dextrose, we're gonna do what, 29.5 is the final concentration times 50. Can somebody do that for me? Thank you, four, I got four, you got 1475, did everybody get that? Milliosmoles per liter. And then the amino acid, so that was the dextrose, what part? is final concentration, which is 9.9 .9, times 100, right, 990. Can somebody add those for us to get the total osmolarity of this two-in-one solution? Five. 
Thank you very much. 2465. 2465. Would you infuse this peripherally? No. So remembering the max, right? The max is 900. We're never going to do that peripherally. So many of those, um, that's the kind of thing um, you will do on the exam. I will, I will give you the uh, rule of thumb, uh, I guess. I'm pretty sure that's what I do. Sorry, I'm not clear, but I usually I think I say, you know, you can dexterous times 50 or whatever. So you have to know how to do it, but I'll remind you. Um, number nine, we've got, <laughs> and I've got to think back, how many, how much lipid did we say we were going to do? Did we say five days a week? Yeah, we said we would give 250 ml lipid five days a week, right? So now we're just, I mean, that lipids um, are added separately. We said we're going to give, I'm just going to write it out again, 250 ml five days a week, right? Um, <coughs> now, I'm going to go back to our calculation to figure out how many we had lipids. How many lipids did we say, grams of lipid? Did we do that? I thought we did. Um, we said we were giving 357 calories per day of lipid. I'm looking at that from our past, you know, when we did the 250. Let me go back over this. If you remember, we did 250. Um, times two calorie per ml was 500 calories <coughs> per day, times five days in the week. We figured out how many calories over, over, you know, in that, all that lipid, and we divided it by seven to figure out the average daily lipid. Okay, is everybody with me? That's what's in the description at, at this step. Um, and then we had, that was 357 calories per day of lipid, and I feel like there was another something else that we did, but I can't remember where I put it, so I'm going to, we can use, if you look at the um, step nine, I'm going to go back to this, right? So we calculated that out. Um, do I need to redo that? Do you want me to redo that? Are you following me? <coughs> How to get the calories? Yes. Okay. Kayleen, and I have a question on number seven, sorry, number eight. Yeah. I don't understand why you multiply dextrose by 50 and amino acids by 100. It's a rule of thumb that works based on the chemistry, and I am not clear where it comes from. I'm, I'm just going to say that it is something that works. And um, at the moment, and uh, you, someone asked me that last time, and I was going to look up where it came from. I, it's been just something that is, it's a, it's a, a working rule of thumb, and I just can't tell you exactly where that comes from, and I really should. So I will look up the math rationale for that. Katie, please remind me that we have to look that up. It's a good question. Like, where does it come from? It's, 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 um, it's solid math. <laughs> just by, uh, um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over this again really quick, because I think just, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about the lipid. Okay, we did it last time. Let's do it again. So we had said, when you have a two-in-one, remember that lipid, you could give it every day, right? But we don't often do that. It's, it's just often what a two-in-one regimen will look like. It's either three times a week or five times a week. Part of that is we don't want to immunosuppress people by giving a, a load of lipid, right? So that's part of it. So the way we did this originally, and I'm going to run out of paper. <laughs> No, I'm not. I have another piece of paper right under there. Okay. Um, so we go 250 ml lipid, 20% 20, 20 lipid. We're always going to, in our class, and for the purposes of this, you can do 10%, but I'm always going to give you 20%. I'm just going to give you that stock solution or the little ampules. It's times 2 calorie per ml equals 500 um, calories, right? Every time we give a 250 ml ampule of lipid, it's 500 calories. We're going to do that on five days a week. OK? 
okay? So that means we're giving 2,500 lipid calories per week, right? And we're going to divide it by seven days in a week to get the daily average lipid that we're going to give. Da daily average lipid calories. And that, if you check in my math, but I think it came to 357 calories per day. Oops. Ah. Of lipid. What questions do you have about that? Okay. Is everybody following me? Now, if we want to figure out how many grams of lipid um, that is, which is where we're at in the sequence of steps, we're at step nine. And I want to know, am I exceeding my maximum lipid infusion rate, right? Which I've told you is one gram per kilogram per day. It's not a minute thing. It's not as complicated. But in order to answer that question, I've got to convert the calories lipid to grams. What do we know about lipids calorie to gram ratio? It's 10, right? 10 calorie per gram. So what do you think we do here? Can, can somebody shout out what we do? Or, I mean, not shout out. Take a, take a <laughs> microphone, if you will. Do you mind, Courtney? Or? Divide by 10? Yeah, so we're going to divide the 357 calories by 10 calories per gram to get the grams lipid, which is what? 35.7, am I right? Which really is 36 grams roughly, right? I mean, if we round it up, we'll, we'll use rounding rules. But <coughs> even if you just want to leave it there, that's the exact. So 36 grams of lipid per day is all we're giving on average. That's not a lot, right? What's the maximum based on step nine and what I told you about lipid infusion? What's the max safe lipid infusion per day for this person? He weighs 77 kilos, so it's 77 grams per day, right? Grams per kilo. So we're well below that. So the answer to the question would be, is this okay to do? Yeah, sure, it's no, not a problem, because we're well below 77, our max daily lipid. Check, this is okay, right? Okay. Okay, now what? Number 10, we can write it out. Now we've got our final, how are we going to write up our final calculation? I mean, our final prescription. Whoa, that's not good enough. <laughs> okay. So, the final prescription in this case, because we're not adding any other volume, so this last bit. Um, we would have done earlier, if we were going to adjust the volume at all, we would have done it when I asked you to do the total volume when we added electrolytes and, you know, say we said, oh, it's not enough fluid, we really want to get more fluid, we, we would have adjusted it there. So we're, we've gone with 1176, our total volume, right? So the final, how you would, one way to write it would be 1176 ml of D29.5 or you could write D, 29.5%. And the, the, the convention around this can vary by hospital and, and, and um, dietitian groups. AA 9.9% or you might say, you know, AA 9.5. I'm not going to write it out in parallel. Um, with standard additives. infused at, what was our rate again? 49, wasn't it? 49 ml um, per hour, right? And we, if, if, if we were doing this as a dietitian consult, you know, we would point out that's the goal rate. And then we're gonna say plus 250 ml 
um, I'm going to stick with the same convention. We could say 20% lipid, or you can write L lowercase 20. Um, and typically, I, I didn't do this. Um, in our example, it says often we do infuse the lipid over 12 hours. It, that also is kind of can vary from place to place. Um, for this, we'll, we'll follow the example and we'll say um, infu or you know infused at or just at 21 ml per hour times 12 hours five times a week or 5x um, ah, per week. So that's following our example as how we might write a final prescription. Are there questions? Can you follow along well enough with the sample calculation? And I'll tell you that your, your quiz and breaking it out by parts is what I'm going to do on the exam. So this is just, it's just a way to practice the individual steps. The, the take home example the case that I probably would, um, I'm not sure if I'll, I'll have to do, I'll have to do part of it. Sir, I just wanted to ask if the 24 hour um, time frame was implied in how the prescription was written, it, unless like otherwise specified? Yeah, it's often implied, um, but we, um, I didn't say this, and I think in my, um, yeah, I guess my example, I didn't really pull that out. And, it, it, and it, it is important, actually, to say times 24 hours or continuous. If you say continuous, I think that, there's an, that it's implied that it's over the, you know, until otherwise noted or whatever. Like when you say cyclic and you say from 8 to 8, <coughs> run it at this, you know, then, then, you, then the, if you don't say it that way, the assumption is 24 hours. But in my, I might even modify this because I think I would probably say continuous. 60 ml per hour, you know. Um, I think it is implied is why probably Adam helped me write this for Fairview um, last term when we, you know, how he actually used to write it for Fairview. Katie, do you have, do you do, you do this? Do you say continuous or times 24 hours or you just assume if you don't specify a time frame that it's just going to be continuous on a Do you have an opinion about that? Um. Yes, I mean, you definitely, you specify your time frame, um, and different facilities will run their lipids different. Yeah, the lipid so, part, for sure. But you're just talking like about... Like the 24-hour, the big part of it. Yeah. If it's a 24-hour, yeah, you know, definitely. Continuous, you, would you say times 24? Yeah, and so you get folks who just get it running overnight, and you just specify that time frame, or you get continuous. So I'll change the sample, actually, just to call that out, because I think I have in the past put continuous or times 24 hours. That's a good question. Any other questions? Have I stunned you into, I hope this isn't intimidating. I, I'm hoping that as you just practice the steps, and you did it already on the PNS and the ENS quiz, you, you broke, up, you know, we broke apart that. We'll do another practice on Monday. We're going to do some practice for the um, the exam as well. And I think I've got to take home um, some practice stuff that I'll, I'll assign you to do for class and then we'll work on together. So I don't want this to be, you know, intimidating on the start. You've got to apologize to, you know, I didn't mean to put you on I so didn't want to do that. So I want to make sure you're comfortable with, with these calculations. All right, any other immediate questions? And I, we, did we do a second break? We did, didn't we? Okay, can you go for five minutes away and come back? And even three would be wonderful, but um, I understand. So top of the hour, we'll start sharp, okay? So even if you want to, yeah, we get some water or whatever. Yeah, I was fine. It's just, sorry. About I that. couldn't no. find what we were doing, so I was behind already, and I was trying to go in order. No, and, and it's like maddening, I realize that. Yeah, because it's, it's, I was also having a struggle with that because yeah. <laughs> the old page over here. And yeah. I had an error on it. I'm pretty sure I can't remember what I did wrong last. Well, maybe I didn't. Maybe I fixed it ultimately. I think we fixed yeah. it. I think I did. But yeah. I'm just slower with it. I really have to think it through. So I think yeah. I'm glad you're going to be doing yeah. more problems because I just it's need to practice. Yeah, no. 
And you're not going to be asked to do start to finish the whole yeah. thing. That's yeah. Unless you want to give us too the much. whole time. <laughs> no, it's just too. Oh. Yeah. It's not important. I, w I just want you guys to be. My rationale for this is that in when people go to internships, I hear it every year that they're so glad that they had exposure to this because they're ahead of their other their fellow <laughs> interns. So it's less. Mm -hmm frightening you know? mm -hmm. when as an intern it's more stress yeah. involved so yeah. um and it's one very universal like you can apply yeah. it they'll do different methods you'll you'll have to you know but you, if you think methodically which is how i try to train you yeah then you can pretty much cope with however method whatever you'll know more than people yeah. teaching you well, often luckily, like I just, you know how to calculate osmolarity yeah. most people don't yeah. i got my clinical rotation i'm doing because i'm in the coordinated master's program oh. so i'm actually doing outpatient oh so i don't even know if i'm gonna have to do this but you it's might, still good to you might not yeah. yeah but your first job you might yeah you never knows. know it might come up yeah. and even if it doesn't yeah. it's yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's really it's like methodical math. <laughs> I'm very, I am like if you throw me in, it's gonna take me a few minutes. I have to go back to my, my method, and I'm very and like work alone in my room. Yeah, and I have to tell you, last semester or not last year, whatever Adam was, <laughs> Adam is extremely bright. You know, I mean not the yeah, he just has this math. And he hated the fact I had to make him methodical. I was like, I'm trying to teach this. <laughs> and he would do it based on shortages, which is why I got into this in the first place. The other easy way to do it, the easiest calculation ever, is a three in one. You know, you can just, anyway, and I'm, I think I'm not, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm going to get there, actually. I probably am, because it's easier, so I did the hardest thing. <laughs> there is a three-in-one sample that steps you through. When you're mixing it all together, I find it easier. You just do the concentration for it. Are, are they developing, like, apps where it's probably plugging, it's going to be plugging in eventually? But that's not as much fun, <laughs> you know. No, I don't know. You know, really, I know that I know that what a lot of places do they just do standard two liters this that and it's just you know, not as fun because you're not really tailoring it. So the control that I had as a nutrition support dietitian was essential role in helping to maximally concentrate. I mean, the pharmacist can do it, but if you don't have a pharmacist on the team and you just have an outpatient, so some places where you have community, very small community hospitals, it's really useful nice to have this skill. Yeah. <laughs> so you can tell the pharmacist what to do. And a lot of my life as a dietitian, that's what I do. <laughs> and don't infuse, I mean, I would check the osmolarity for people. Yeah, so that's, so I was just but the truth of the is, it's way easier. Probably in your real life, you know. But tell me how it goes. <laughs> When you're out and about, you know, when you're actually functioning, you have to yeah. do it. I would love to know how. You have to do it. If you ever have time, you won't have time. But if you have time, I would be interested. Okay, are we coming back together? Okay, are we on HDMI? I don't know if you want to say this. This is as far as I can find. This is about so five milliosmoles dextrose. Oh, it's just it a it's just a chemistry that, problem. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's so, great. We could put we could put that in our. Um. Hey, guys, Katie came up with a fantastic. No, no, I think, no, I think it actually, I think that's exactly what, where it, the, comes, where it from. comes from. So the osmolarity question, ha, I can answer it, thanks to Katie. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the chemistry of dextrose as an entity, right, macromolecule, as Cole would say, is five milliosmoles per gram. So electrolytes, remember I gave you that slide on electrolytes and sodium is different from potassium, you know, different you can calculate these exactly based on their chemical, um, their properties. So dextrose is five milliosmoles per gram. Amino acids are, um, solutions are 10 milliosmoles per gram. And that's where it comes from, the 50 and 100. So you've, you're just taking the percent. That makes more sense. It, it's nice to understand why. Yeah. Can we put that somewhere like in my, 
yep. notes or something. Yep. So we <laughs> that down. I always try to tell you the why. I'm glad you asked it. Um, okay. Ah, sadly, I'm back to lecturing. Oh, you know, I'm sorry, but I want to get through GI because you guys have an exam. I mean, that whole time, oh, the poor people that have to hear that. Oh, vast swaths of quiet, or me doing, I don't know what, saying over the, that's terrible. Ah. I always. So the last part of GI is short bowel syndrome. And, um, the definition of short bowel syndrome has, is, is a totally moving target in far, as far as I, um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you sort of a general, but in terms of what, how much bowel is left that constitutes short bowel, that has changed quite a lot over the time I've been um, in RD. So in general, you would define it as this sequelae or constellation of, of metabolic and physiologic consequences associated with the loss of the small bowel, mostly after massive resection, multiple massive resections. It could happen traumatic injury to the GI tract or cancer, Crohn's disease. These are common um, reasons. <coughs> now, this is a mantra that I want you to just think about um, and you know, keep in mind that the site and extent of resected bowel determines the severity of the symptoms. So the what is more important than the how much, what part of the small bowel is removed is more significant often than how much is removed. And the mucosal integrity and function of the remaining intestine also will have an impact on the severity of symptoms. So the severity of symptoms dictated by the how, the, the what that gets removed and the remaining function, the integrity and function of the remaining bowel. Um, now, if you get the, the jejunum resected, this is far less problematic than if the ileum gets resected. So I'll say that again. Let me say it the other way, actually. It's far more significant to lose the ileum than it is to lose the jejunum. And that's because the ileum is multi-talented. It can assume the jejunal functions. Um, but the other, thing, other way around does not happen. So the jejunum is not able to start absorbing fluid and electrolytes better. It can't assume the, the very unique functions of the ileum, right, which are not on this slide, so I can ask it really quick. What are the two big things that we started the day talking about that the ileum, if you lose it or if you've got ileitis, you are going to have trouble with? B12 absorption and bile salt reabsorption, which impacts lipid absorption. So bile salt reabsorption and vitamin B12 reabsorption. If the, those two things, jejunum cannot do for us, for the ileum. On the other, other hand, the ileum really does pretty well. Uh, compensating for the jejunum. Um, the two exceptions to that, if you lose the jejunum, you, you're likely to have lactase deficiency, so you're going to have lactose malabsorption, and you're going to probably need pancreatic enzyme replacement because when you lose the jejunum, you lose CCK and secretin, um, so you're going to, you know, we can, we can um, that, that stimulation of the pancreas is lost if you lo completely lose the jejunum. Key point here, loss of the ileum, far more impactful than loss of the je je jejunum. Now, consequences of site of resection. Guess what? This is a repeat, so I'm not even going to say it. When you have the major resection of the ileum, we already know what happens. I, want, I have given you a better explanation. So over here in the green, star this. It means go back into the notes and learn this and be able to talk about it as I've presented it in Crohn's because I was more detailed there, okay? I'm just sort of getting, hitting the high points here. Now, what happens if you lose the ileocecal valve, right? That's the connection between the ileum and the colon. If you lose the ileocecal valve, that's a really important problem to have. It means that you will have faster transit time because you lose the ileal break. 
which slows stuff down earlier in the tract, so by loss of that. You, so you're going to increase transit time means you're going to go faster through. Actually, not increase. You're going to shorten transit time. I always do this. I make the wrong. Faster transit time means shorter. You, anyway, just think faster, moving faster through the, through the GI tract. Less absorption, more diarrhea and malabsorption. Okay. You will also very likely get uh, bacterial overgrowth. Can you think about that? The ileocecal valve keeps the colonic bacteria, which are like 10, t I mean, a lot more abundant than are in the ileum. If you lose that valve, the colonic bacteria can overgrow, and that's a major issue. I talked about bacterial overgrowth earlier in Crohn's, and I think I've given a better explanation there. So go back in the notes to, to learn about bacterial overgrowth. Um, in the Crohn's section. If you lose both the ileum and the colon, you've got a significant impact on fluid and electrolyte status. You lose the colonic absorptive surface, and you've got the loss of the ileocolonic break. So you've got fast transit time, and not very, you're not absorbing and reabsorbing fluid and, and um, salts, electrolytes very well. So that's a major, gets worse. So you can imagine the symptoms are going to be worse with that kind of consequence or, or situation. Other consequences of um, resection, um, gastric hypersecretion, and um, virtually all people that have had, that are, that are characterized as short bowel because they've lost a significant amount of the, the GI tract or small intestine are going to be on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, or H2 blockers to reduce gastric hypersecretion. Um, the consequence on pancreatic enzymes, if you've got excessive you know, gastric hypersecretion, hyper is you're going to deactivate and reduce your ability to use, um, to digest, because the pancreatic enzymes in the duodenum will be um, excessively you know, um, acidified. So the adaptation um, following resection is a really important process. And our, our small intestine is remarkably resilient and able to adapt. And the, 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 the processes by which this happens, cellular hyperplasia, villus hypertrophy, uh, intestinal lengthening, and changes in the, the motility to actually to, to get less, um, you know, we said faster transit time. Well, it'll slow down, and, and over time, as you get more absorptive surface, people do pretty well. I mean, often they do pretty well. This process can take three months to more than a year after a massive resection. It's thought to be enhanced by just having nutrients in the lumen of the gut. So feeding people, enteral feeding, right, always, um, is, is positive. It's also enhanced by if you've got the jejunum in, uh, intact and you've got the duodenum intact where you've got pancreatobiliary secretions, that's really helpful. So you can imagine if you've lost the duodenum and the jejunum, okay, you're going to have more heart, you know, it's going to be a more difficult time. There's been a lot of work looking at giving short-chain fatty acids for, again, the colonocytes. So always I want you to associate short-chain fatty acids with um, helping the remainder of the, you know, the colon to actually do well and to, to, to um, you know, regenerate and, and, and absorb fluid and electrolytes. Glutamine is really a preferred energy source for the small intestine, so whatever is remaining there can help by getting glutamine. And there have been some studies on growth hormone that have not really panned out for the cost and some growth factors that have also, but, um, um, to do glutide, which um, is a GLP-1 uh, or 2 antagonist. I'm not going to talk to you. I don't think I'm going to talk to you about this, so I'm going to just say there's some drug. Oh, it's coming. Never mind. It's ahead. We'll leave that for the moment, okay? I'll give you a, a name so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, medications. I guess this is where I have it. This in the next slide. So meds, you may see octreotide, which is a somatostatin analog. Somatostatin is something is a hormone that the pancreas produces. It suppresses GI secretions. 
Um, it suppresses fistula output as well. So we, you might see people with Crohn's with a fistula or anyone else with a fistula being given IV octreotide because it suppresses fistula and other GI secretion output. So it can reduce those intestinal losses. And then if they've got a proximal small bowel resection, again, with the jejunum, um, particularly pancreatic enzyme replacement, um, if they've lost the duodenum um, as well, pancreatic enzyme replacement can be helpful to counter the consequences of that. H2 receptor antagonists, proton pump inhibitors, that is common. Antibiotics may be needed to treat uh, bacterial overgrowth. I've got growth hormone. Those studies that have um, looked at growth hormone have mixed results uh, over time. And then this was the one I just mentioned, taduglutide, glucagon-like peptide 2 and its analog. Um, it has anti-secretory. Uh, it tends to slow transit tends to help uh, the intestine turn over and re recover. And um, people have to stay on it, unfortunately. So it's not something that they, so far anyway, it seems to be a drug, a medication that um, requires kind of ongoing treatment to maintain. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking here. I think I've just got a few slides, so if you're with me. Elisa. My aunt was on medication called Gatex or Gatex, G-A-T-T-E-X. That was, I think it's experimental or at least it's under, it's in the process of becoming an approved drug for sure about thinking. Wonderful. And it was like. I don't know the action of that, so. $30,000 a month. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know what, I'm going to look that up that, Katie and I are going to look that up just okay. to know how it acts. So thanks yeah. for bringing that yeah. up. It was supposed to help her with absorption. Yeah. It may, I'm not sure. So I will look that up just to see. Um, thanks for sharing that though. So first three months, we're really focused on fluid and resuscitation, fluid and electrolyte um, resuscitation provision IV, 100% PN support. Um, there's a progression, I gave you an article on it that talks about how we initiate um, we're trying to give oral as soon as possible. There's benefit to the luminal nutrients. Remember what we said. So, we, so PN is to kind of meet the base, the most of their needs because they are unable to absorb when they really, when, again, when somebody has significant short gut. Um, it facilitates adaptation to give oral intake. Um, we will um, basically encourage people to eat over what they would normally eat. 50% more than they normally eat. We call that, you know, hyperphagia. Small meals a day. And we're going to be monitoring their output. And so the way that we gradually transition to total oral and wean off only when uh, weight loss um, is below a kilo a week and particularly when diarrhea, the, the fecal output is not... Uh, you know, these cut points here. So below 600 grams per day, you know, I'm, I'm saying this backwards. Let me just say how it's written. If weight loss is substantial, more than a kilo a week, or diarrhea is above 600 grams, then we go back to full PN. So a lot of moving forward and a few steps back, forward and back. And I see that we are out of time, so I am going to leave this be. I think we may call it done. I've given you enough, I think, that you can Start your reviewing, hopefully, of the study guide, okay? Because the GI is substantial. I'm going to give you some things to help you think through this. And I'd highly recommend talking through with your study buddies, you know, explaining how things happen. Why do you get fat malabsorption with X, Y, or Z problem? And I'll give you some practice here. So thanks for your attention. Have a nice evening.
Hey. I have a question. Yeah. So I emailed you a while ago about taking the final exam early because I'm going out of town. Yeah. We have an early set. And you I do? Just have okay. To post about this. No, that's so fine. I just we wanted. Got a room. Okay. Well, we had a room for this one and I forgot. It. Um, I'm pretty sure we have a room. Okay. No, that's so fine. I, I just wanted to. Okay. And I can't remember if it was. I think I was trying to accommodate the you. So I might have. Okay. okay, either one works. I just have a morning exam on that Friday, so hopefully. I mean, so hopefully so it's in the... Working with you, so if you, if you okay. really find that it's uncomfortable. Okay. It's, it's a long day. No, I don't can't okay. remember. Um, well, if you find it in the post above, yeah. then we can. Let me do that. Thank you. Okay, and if so you don't see that, will you please remind me? Okay. I'll, should I rem I'll remind you after this exam. Maybe that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.